I'm here just to introduce um, uh, the two uh, uh, people who are up here on the stage, both of whom you most, most likely know, and then to turn the microphone over to them. Um, Byron August gra graduated summa cum laude from Ezra Stiles College in 1989, uh, majoring ec in economics and political science. He went on to earn an MPhil and a DPhil um, in economics from Oxford University, where he was a Marshall Scholar. He joined McKinsey and Company in Los Angeles in 1993. He's now a senior partner at McKinsey's Washington, D.C. office, where he works primarily in the fields of high technology, information and service-based businesses, education, and, edu and economic development. Byron also serves as director of McKinsey's social sector office, which works with institutions in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors worldwide uh, on projects to improve education and health outcomes, uh, economic growth and opportunity, and institutional capacity for social innovation. Previously, Byron founded and led McKinsey's high-tech services sector and served on the global committees that elect and evaluate new partners. An active writer and speaker on globalization, technology, education, and economic strategies, he's the author of The Economics of International Payments Union and Clearinghouses, published in 1997. Byron's co-founder and board chairman of the Hope Street Group, a nationwide nonpartisan volunteer organization of professionals, executives, and entrepreneurs developing and promoting public policies to expand economic opportunity. He's a trustee of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, has served on advisory boards of the World Economic Forum and Center for American Progress, and he was appointed by President Obama in 2010 to the White House Council for Community Solutions. Uh, he was named successor trustee in 2011 and is a former member of the Yale University Council, but as I said at the start, the most important feature is he's a Stylesian. President Richard Levin needs no introduction. He's the Frederick William Beinecke Professor of Economics, and he's been Yale's president since 1993. He received his BA from Stanford University in 1968, and then studied politics and philosophy at Oxford University, where he, jo where he earned a B.Litt degree. He received his PhD from Yale in 1974, uh, and joined the Yale faculty. Before becoming president, he chaired the economics department here, and served as dean of Yale's Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, we're all, as you know, indebted to President Levin for his work not only on behalf of the wider world in the state of Connecticut uh, and of the city of New Haven, but also for his work on behalf of the residential colleges, uh, including Ezra Stiles. Uh, it was thanks to his leadership and the generosity of our donors that this college received what can only be called a total overhaul, uh, a renewal, a real renovation, several years ago. And I think by now all of you have seen the, the, the fruits of that uh, renovation work. We thanked him publicly and effusively when we formally reopened this college of rededication ceremonies in November of 2011, and we're very glad to have the second opportunity to thank him yet again for the work that went into this renovation. Thank you, President Levin. Uh, you all know that President Levin has announced that the 2012-2013 year will be his last as president of the university unless this community of Stylesians decides to try to persuade him otherwise here in our dining hall today. Uh, he is today, uh, he's here today to engage in conversation with Byron and with all of us to share his thoughts on the residential college system, its past, present, and future, uh, and on the past, pre present, and future of the university. Uh, it's a real privilege to host him here on this historic occasion the first residential college reunion, a moment in which we can stand back and reflect upon the renovation of all 12 residential colleges and to look forward to the construction of two new residential colleges uh, in the coming year. It's a time, too, to recognize the university's support for Ezra Stiles uh, and for other uh, distinguished, if in some ways lesser, residential college communities on campus. <laughs> Thank you, President Levin, for being here. Thanks, Steve. Um, I, I've been fortunate enough to have a chance to uh, interact with President Levin uh, quite intensively here at Yale in our work together on the Hewlett Foundation in a number of contexts, and, and uh, getting uh, an hour of his insights uh, is a real privilege. I mean, he's one of uh, 
the great minds, uh, honestly, that I have, I have interacted with on a whole range of topics. So keeping that in mind, I'm going to try to organize this conversation to get um, the most that we can uh, out of President Levin. So we're going to talk, he and I are going to talk for about a half an hour, and then about a half an hour of your comments. And we're going to try to keep it moving pretty quickly, have uh, questions uh, quick, and get as much time uh, over to, to, uh, to Rick to hear from him. So in that spirit, um, Rick, uh, the program says this conversation is about looking forward. And we are going to look forward. But uh, given the announcement that you're going to be ending your illustrious tenure as president of Yale, um, I think it's important to spend just a little bit of time looking back. And I'd love to know what you were most proud of in your 19 years as president and what you think your presidency uh, will mean, what people will think about 25 years from now, 50 years from now. What, what was it all about? Great. Well, thanks. That's a, that's a great question to try to answer. But before I do, let me just say it's wonderful to see so many people here for this uh, first ever residential college reunion. It's a concept that many people have talked about for years. And thanks to Mark Dahlhoff's leadership at the AYA, we're now, and Steve uh, Pitty's entrepreneurship and wanting to be the first, uh, first out of the gate, um, we, ha we have this underway. And no doubt there'll be some follow-up survey to find out how you've actually enjoyed this. Uh, but it, uh, you know, it's, I, it, I'm one of the few people I've spoken with uh, on the way in. Sounds like it's going very well. I think it's terrific. And I, I'm, I'm just curious, because one of the things we conjectured was that a residential college reunion might attract a significant number of people who don't come normally to their five-year class reunion. So how many of you have not been to a class reunion for the past 10 years? OK, so actually more of you have. How many have been to a class reunion in the last 10 years? Well, OK, that's, that's social science. <laughs> um, <laughs> conjecture is falsified. Uh, OK. So, um, but anyway, thanks for being here. It's great. Uh, so, I, you know, my presidency, I think, it, 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 the themes have been pretty conspicuous because, partly because I, I that was very self-conscious. There were some major objectives when I first became president of Yale that we focused on really through the first decade, but most intensively in the first five years. And they were to, uh, to renovate the campus, to really develop a systematic plan for catching up on what was over $2 billion of deferred maintenance, including the 12 residential colleges, the stack tower of the Sterling Library, the, the key facilities in the Payne Whitney gym, and every classroom building on campus, most of the science labs on campus. There was a tremendous amount of work to do to uh, uh, the arts facilities and so forth. So we, we systematically divided the campus up into planning groups. And within the first three years, really developed plans for a kind of comprehensive re renovation of the, of the campus. And you know, now, um, $5 billion of investment later, we can say that we have effectively caught up. We have a really well-maintained and beautifully renovated uh, set of buildings and a lot of new ones as well. So I'd say physical building would be one of the hallmarks. Changing the game in New Haven was another huge priority. Uh, when I take took over, um, the downtown was unsafe. There were very few residents in the downtown. It was abandoned by 9 o'clock at night. It was, it was a dangerous place. We would had a murder on right on Hill House Avenue in 1991. There was a, we were in the middle of a wave of uh, massive flight of middle class people out to the suburbs. Uh, lots of vacants, vacant housing in the neighborhoods that faculty and staff inhabited. Uh, also, lots of sh vacant storefronts in the downtown. We really worked at building our bona fides with community groups and with the political leaders in New Haven to convince them that we were credible partners. And, with, and we did some things early to arrest the, the migration of people out of the, uh, out of the town with our home buyer subsidy. Within three or four years, the mayor convinced of our, of our, that we really did have genuine interest in the well-being of the city, actually asked us to redevelop the downtown. And so in an unprecedented uh, move, where a nonprofit took the lead in you know, buying up a very good chunk of the downtown footprint, becoming the largest commercial landlord and the largest commercial taxpayer in New Haven. Um, we've done, a, I think, a terrific job in turning around what was a very um, bad story. And, uh, and that, that partnership remains very strong today and I think is sufficiently institutionalized it will survive. 
then, you know, about five years in, we started to think more ambitiously about what the key academic initiatives should be. And really for the past 15 years, I would say there have been two major themes and many, and many sub-motifs, but the major themes uh, have been to strengthen science at Yale. Yale has been historically incredibly strong in the humanities and the arts, and we have great professional schools across the arts and, and in environment and in law and, and divinity, but, but the, our reputation in the sciences and engineering somewhat lagged our reputation in the, in the softer disciplines. And I thought for a university to be truly great in the 21st century, um, you, one needed to be in, you know, on the short list of great scientific institutions as well as in the other areas. And so we've invested considerably in strengthening our faculties and in rebuilding our facilities. We, we, the, the financial crisis put a kind of pause on the development, our developments on Science Hill, but we've gotten partway through that process. But what is striking is in the life sciences um, from, uh, and including chemistry, I would say our, our science departments now stand and across the medical school are now much better than they than they ever have been historically and are really really a powerhouse. And then finally, a real passion for me from the time of my inauguration, and I commented on it in my inaugural address, is that we're, you know, Byron and I have one professional interest in common. We've both studied the phenomenon of globalization and how it has brought uh, nations together and peoples together and completely transformed the way we interact with the rest of the world. I felt very strongly that we needed to become a much bigger player in, in the international arena to attract more foreign students to Yale, to make them a more visible part of the Yale College community. If you went to Yale before my time, there were only two or three percent of the class who were international. Today it's 10 percent. It makes a huge difference in the, in the life of our American students to have classmates who come from all around the world. It immediately gives them an opportunity in the, in the suites from freshman year on to form close relationships with people who see the world differently, who have different values, different perspective, and, and I think that kind of cross-cultural understanding is actually critical to the future. So we've set up all kinds of international programs. 1,400 kids a year go overseas from Yale College, mostly during summers. We've created a whole matrix of interesting opportunities for them and give financial aid to support it. So I would say those are the those are sort of the big four. There have been a lot of other things that have been important to me as well. Well, in, in doing that, I mean, you've made some pretty big moves, including some quite recently. Um, for example, in science, I think about the West Campus. And I don't know how many people in the room know about the, the purchase of the West Campus and the work that's going on there. But that, I, I, I'd love you to say a bit about what that means for science at Yale and how you're thinking about it. Right. Well, while we're in the midst of uh, this emphasis on science, we we had this serendipitous opportunity when, uh, when uh, the Bayer Pharmaceutical Company decided to downsize its research operations and put up for sale its campus in West Haven, Connecticut, just seven miles from here, right at I-95. Um, and uh, we, we jumped at the opportunity. It, there was a half a million square feet of state-of-the-art science laboratories, a huge amount of science equipment. Um, there were other buildings, some Class A office space, a warehouse and manufacturing plant, all of which had space with great potential for Yale activities. And um, nobody, of course, was in, there were no bidders who valued the science laboratories as much as we did. And consequently, we were able to get a facility that would have cost us six, at least six or seven hundred million dollars to replicate, plus 136 acres of land for $109 million, and to boot, they threw in about $50 million of, of science equipment, a lot of scientific instruments, a lot of which had, were in crates that had never been opened. So it, it was, uh, literally, this was Yale's Louisiana purchase, an incredible opportunity. <laughs> and and um, so we've started half a dozen scientific research institutes there. It's still in the ramp up phase. We're, 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 we're way under occupied at this point but we've hired some really s terrific people and we're using it for interdisciplinary programs that are, more, that are, that are uh, centered on applied science and medicine and, and that are, I think, held a great will create a great opportunity for us to recruit new people and to bring together people from the medical school and, the, and from science and engineering on the main campus to work on 
common problems in cancer, for example, is one of the institute's systems biology, energy, energy sciences. Um, these are, these are going to be, I think, terrific contributions. We're using the facility also for the arts. The, the old manufacturing plant turns out to be perfect for the storage of, our, of the collections that don't fit into the art gallery of the British Art Center or the Peabody Museum. And we set up a center for conservation science out there, so we bring the conservation disciplines from art objects to anthropological collections to, to natural history collections to library collections. And they're working together on conservation science and digitization on the old campus. And then to boot, the nursing school has decided to move there to occupy some of the excellent office facilities that are there. And so that'll bring up the critical mass of people. So it's, it still has, it's, I'd say it's beyond the tipping point now, but it's still got a long way to go to be fully developed uh, and to really feel like part of Yale. But it, it's great potential opportunity for the future. Rick, I want to just, uh, a couple of the threads of what you've been talking about. You talked about the work on the West Campus in science as being interdisciplinary. And then even the work, not just among the sciences even, but uh, between arts and the sciences, as you think about some of the internationalization initiatives, the Jackson Institute, a big interdisciplinary component to those, what is the, the, the relative role of interdisciplinary work and studies versus strengthening the disciplines? And how do you think about that going forward? Because that's sort of a, a question yeah. kind of at the heart of the work of the university. You know, I think in a place like this, you have to concentrate on both and, not either or. That is, the universities are largely evaluated by the quality of their faculties, and that does trickle down, after all, to the quality of their, of their educational programs. And so maintaining the strength in the traditional disciplines is important and something we've been very committed to. But at the same time, so much of the innovation in, in both teaching and research comes at the, at, the, at the interaction of disciplines. I'm looking at Steve Pitty and thinking, he's one of the leaders and founders of our interdisciplinary program on ethnicity, race, and migration, which, which is a really novel approach to the question. I mean, it, Yale didn't go the route of having separate you know, majors or concentrations in, in each and every sort of ethnic group. Uh, we have a longstanding African-American studies program, but we didn't sort of complement that with four other uh, such programs. Instead, this was Steve and his colleagues conceived of a program that would bring together social scientists and humanists to think about, on a global scale, problems of ethnicity, race, and migration, and, and subsume under that you know, partic the more particular studies of the experience of Native Americans and, and Hispanic Americans and, and so forth. It's a, but that's just one example, but it gives you an idea that this is, that's a real innovation, nationally as well as at Yale. And w there are many examples of that. The Jackson Institute of Global Affairs is another kind of example that brings together po politics, economics, and culture, cultural studies together uh, under common rubric. And we started a new major in global affairs that is rapidly becoming one, one of the most popular at Yale College. Mm -hmm. So Rick, you're talking to Stylesians here. And our common experience is, as undergraduates, you know, a, a residential college experience. But Yale is an enormously complex, diverse uh, institution. Um, I mean, it's got hundreds of millions of dollars in in, in research programs, it's got a medical school with a, an enormous and growing uh, clinical practice. It's got graduate and professional schools of tremendous stature and ambition. Um, given all that, given that scope and complexity, what is the role of the residential college um, in Yale today and in Yale tomorrow? Well, if Yale College remains as it does the core of the university, the residential colleges are the core of Yale College. So. The core of the core, really. It's an incredibly important feature of undergraduate education and life here, as you know. And, and, um, and so we, we feel very determined to maintain that very special characteristic. I mean, one of the things that makes Yale undergraduate education so spectacular is that incredibly strong sense of community. Now, that, would, that strong sense of community would be very hard to, to create in a school that you know, had sort of the typical musical chairs dormitory situation. I, I went to Stanford as an undergraduate. You know, there are 120 housing options, and you move around each year to a different one. So, you know, you form friendship groups, but, you, but 
you don't have a, it's, it's not a school that produces a very strong sense of community. It's a great place and you get a great education, but it doesn't have what we have. It's just that strong identity, the same group of people that come in as your classmates and college mates so that you have a cohort just about at the margins of, of you know, who, who you would all know by name, you know, 100, 100 120 people that, um, that, that really give you a strong sense of identity and actually create there's enough diversity within the group that large that if you decide two years into college that the extracurriculars you've been doing up to now are not the things that interest you anymore, you want to start something else, in some schools that's really hard to do because there's a whole group of, an in crowd of people that are doing journalism and you've been doing singing groups or whatever. You know, here it's so much easier because you have your college mates in your class that, who are populating all these different groups. So people can switch around, they can sample, they can experiment. So I, I really think the colleges just play a tremendously important role. And then finally, it gives an adult presence. And this is actually something that I think we've improved in the last 20 years. That is, the, the dedication, I, I mean, I've made a real point of appointing people to the masterships, as have the deans of Yale College and appointing college deans, to appoint people that really care and that are really going to put themselves in, throw themselves into the work, not just you know, to host a few events, but to really be involved with the students and really know them and really help them and counsel them and be mentors and advisors and role models. And um, I think it just works here. It works, frankly, it works here better. The, the other place that has the same theoretical structure is Harvard, and I think this works better for, for two reasons. One, the dedication of the, st of the staff and the lives of the students, and second, the fact that we assign people randomly to colleges when they come in so that each college is a true microcosm of the whole rather than allow self, you know, some sort of mixed self-selection after year one, um, after friendship groups have already formed. It's, um, it's, we really have it right, I think, and re with the renovations making the physical facilities now the equal of the, the social dimensions, I think we really got something great that will be preserved for a long, long time. And yeah, and we've all, you know, uh, uh, most of us have had a chance to look around <coughs> at Styles uh, today and yesterday and, and, and be on the campus, and it's, it's really an amazing place, a really vibrant place. So it's, it's kind of hard uh, to believe, sitting here, that higher education in this country is troubled at all, and yet um, there's a lot of conversation about the, the troubles in higher education, mm -hmm. about the rising costs, you know, uh, more difficulty for people to access higher education, uh, uneven quality and challenge of online, et cetera. So how do you, how do you see the future of higher education unfolding in this country? So th it's a really important question and there is a lot of public concern about higher education today. And I think it's so often just mischaracterizes the sector. It, it really, higher education is very highly differentiated in the United States. It's not like some countries, take Germany, where basically there's sort of a kind of uniformity. All of the schools are kind of more or less at the same level and get comparable funding largely from the state. Um, the U.S. has a, you know, a kind of a tiered system. We have the elite private institutions, Ivy League and Stanford and Chicago and MIT and, 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 and then a number of others in the next tier, Duke and Rice and, and places like that that are, that are basically supported from tuition and private contributions. Then you have the outstanding state universities, the flagship ones, the, the, UC, the, the flagship UC system, Virginia, Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, excellent schools, but then most states have tiers as well, state colleges, community colleges that are two-year schools, and then there's, a whole, then there's a whole set of liberal arts colleges, some of them well supported, some of them really marginal. And, and now there are all these new players of online or mixed online and and uh, localized, um, uh, you know, for-profit institutions that are that are changing the landscape. Each of these, is, there's a different dynamic in each one of these. And if you really want to understand what's going on, you have to think, you have to look a little more closely. The, by and large, the the not-for-profit, um, you know, first-tier research universities are doing extremely well. I mean, the the, the research funding has held up. Our tuitions have gone up, yes, and the costs have gone up, but with the generous financial aid that we've been able to offer and the priority that we and our peers have given to financial aid, you'd be surprised to hear this. 
the average price paid by a Yale, by Yale parent has gone down 1.1% per year during my presidency. That, that is to say the financial aid growth has, has, has been faster than the growth of tuition. It's all inflation adjusted. But, but basically, a real decline of over 20% in the cost of education for the average Yale student, which is, since now almost 60% of the students have some financial aid, it's a really dramatic thing. Now, that's not true. The, 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 the real problem with rising costs are the state-supported schools, where their tuitions have gone up in the last dozen years at double the rate of the private sector schools. They started from a much lower base, but because of the pressures on state governments, which is actually a reflection not just of the recession, which has added to the problem, but is actually a recession of rising health, uh, an effect of rising health care costs. What you've seen is a massive shift in state budgets from education to health care as the principal expenditure. And, and uh, you know, that, so when we say we have a health care crisis, the, the education crisis in the public institutions is largely a byproduct of the health care crisis. So I, I don't think people really understand this, but it's, I think it's important to really know what's going on. I'll just say one more thing. The, the, the innovations in online education don't really threaten Yale's. They, they do threaten some of these lower tier marginal liberal arts colleges and they uh, threaten presumably some of the lower tier public institutions, especially those that, whose costs have gone up, because you can get more, you know, now a technical degree, uh, um, j you know, job qualifications. The, the things that have so far worked best in online education are things that are more vocationally oriented and, and uh, or, or applied to engineering kind of courses. And th I think they do, they do have potentially positive impact uh, for the whole sector. For us, um, you know, it's going to be a long time before online learning supplants the kind of residential experience that we offer, which is still very unique and very special and can't be thoroughly replicated online. On the other hand, technology provides all kinds of interesting opportunities for us, as well as other, as well as other places. But I mean, we're, we have more and more professors now who are have taped their lectures. You know, we have 40 online Yale courses, full full sets of, uh, of videotaped courses. We have a number of professors now who are asking their students to watch the videotape and, and before they come to class, and then they use the class time to lead discussion among the students. So you actually get better teaching as a consequence of this online tool in those circumstances. So Rick, you, I mean, you paint a very uh, rosy picture for Yale, even, though, even as you have these you know, big structural challenges and, uh, and transformations in, in the sector. Is there anything you worry about for Yale? I mean, I mean, Yale is obviously a you know tremendously strong position, but as you think, you know, ten years ahead, twenty years ahead, is there anything you think that we all, those of us who love Yale, need to keep our eye on and really be alert to? What What do you see out there? Well, you know, we have thrived you know, over essentially the first uh, sixteen of my twenty years because of a, 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 a in part because of a rising economic you know, tied, strong financial markets, a growing endowment, jet, the capacity of our alumni and parents and friends to give Yale the resources to do all this expansion and renovation and program enhancement. I mean, we, we, we've been very fortunate that a strong economy has, has enabled us to make, you know, a lot more progress from 1993 to 2008 than, you know, we ever counted on, frankly. So I'd say the biggest worry is what's the future of the economy? Is it, it, are, are we going to get the kind of robust economic growth and rising endowments that and rising gifts that will support the school's continued, you know, appetite for improvement? Um, you know, we have we're we're strongly undergirded for if there's not another setback in the economy um, in terms of maintaining our existing programs. But you know. Universities, I think, um, can't, it, we're the kind, it's the nature of the beast is we can't really stand still for too long. Uh, Woody Allen has this wonderful line in Annie Hall about relationships, and I would apply it to universities. You know, universities are like a shark. It, they, they have to keep moving or they die. <laughs> and that's, uh, um, I think that's true. 
Well, we've been talking about uh, residential colleges and Yale and universities in general. But in, in, that, in your last comments, you brought up the U.S. economy and the relationship, uh, the, the relationship between the health of universities like Yale and the U.S. economy. Um, I, I want to broaden that question because besides being, you know, one of the great university presidents of this generation or any other generation, um, you're also a distinguished economist. You're a member of the President's Council on Science and Technology. Um, uh, I think a lot of us here are concerned. Um, with the U.S. economy, uh, its future, not just you know, where we are in terms of the recession and the jobs numbers, but the, the structural underpinnings of the economy. You described a higher education sector where the top institutions are doing great, um, and uh, the other institutions, the middle and the bottom, are, are really struggling. Well, you could say that about many other sectors of our mm -hmm. uh, economy, exactly. including um, uh, our families and our communities uh, in this country. So I would just love your, your view, you know, as you've thought about it, um, you know, what, is, uh, what might a comeback plan for the U.S. economy look like, and, uh, and what's, uh, what might Yale's role be in that? We're fellow economists, and we've actually talked about this a lot, and I think our views are pretty much aligned. Um, you know, we, 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 we botched the recovery by not investing enough in job creation quickly so that we've had this protracted uh, high unemployment some signs that things, yesterday's news is hopeful, but, uh, but still we've been, we've been, we've had high unemployment and, and, uh, uh, and many people underemployed for an awfully long time. And that's, that's, um, you know, that, that threatens a whole, you know, millions of people who lose their self-esteem and are going to have a harder time coping. So I, I've long been of the view, I mean, starting in, in, in fact, you can go back and check this. There are various economics panels throughout the course of the recession that are on YouTube that can, some of our best people in the economics department, and I've been involved moderating most of them. Um, uh, but you, the, the Yale line on this is pretty consistent. We needed a very strong stimulus, and at the same time, a grand bargain on taxes and, and entitlement programs so that out in the future, we can, we can bring the budget back under control. But it, you have to, I mean, my view is in 09, in 11, and in 13, it, it's still the same prescription. We need to create some jobs, and we can do that productively in ways that will benefit the long term by, by focusing those jobs on infrastructure creation, both, both in physical infrastructure and in skill development and manpower uh, uh, investments. At, at the, on the one hand, on the other, we really do, we have to face the issue. I mean, Taxes are way too low given the scale of this economy. They were the lowest tax, lowest effective tax. You know, taxes are a lower share of GDP than in any developed country in the world, and and um, it just doesn't support the cost that we have to bear as a society. So, the bargain has to include reform of Social Security and Medicare, and at the same time, uh, uh, get more tax revenue. Now that can be done by without raising tax rates at the margin because there's so many, uh, there's so many deductions and, and loopholes in the tax code that it actually is possible to, if you went for a very comprehensive tax reform, you could actually, I think, not get away with lower ta uh, marginal tax rates than you have today, or at least than you would have with the Bush tax cuts um, expired. So I think, um, you know, I think there's, there's rational opportunity here. You know, we can sit here as economists and we can design uh, things that would really work. What's uh, the obvious impediment is politics. Politics. Okay. <laughs> well, listen, we're going to, I want to get you into the conversation. We've got two microphones, and just to kind of uh, keep it moving, we'd appreciate it if you can come up to the microphones. Please do identify your, your, your name and your, your class and ask your question. Feel free to come on up. Um, if you, by the way, if you can't come up to the microphone and you need someone to bring it to you, we'll, we'll be happy to do that. But if you can, it would be great. We'll, we'll get more questions in and more answers in. You just if line you, up at the two mics. If you, sorry, the two mics are, are, are right up here. Yep, go ahead. Hi, uh, Nicole Posey, class of 1994. Um, as a, a staff member of Environmental Defense Fund, I've been very keen to see the leadership that Yale University has been taking in right. issues of uh, sustainability from everything from your speeches on um, the need to address 
social science issues and science issues and climate change down to sustainability in residential life um, with new innovative meal plans and whatnot. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the areas in which Yale really has taken leadership in these areas from thought leadership to actual university um, operations and where you see Yale taking leadership in these areas right. in the future. Well, if I had talked about six themes instead of four, I would have mentioned sustainability as one of, as, as the, on the next uh, tier, next tier of, of priorities. We, we, we really have uh, decided as an institution to try to model um, uh, sustainability practice uh, to the extent we can and we can that we and we can do that in an economically intelligent way um, so so we committed in 2005 to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by effectively 43 percent from the, the, the then current levels that that number was arrived at by saying we want to be 10 percent below our 1990 levels by 2020 we're we're uh, uh, not quite there. I mean, we're, we've, we're maybe 15 to 18 percent reduced in greenhouse gas emissions since we started, uh, but we're continuing to focus on it, continuing to affect improvements. We're, we've, we've retrofitted windows and uh, switch and uh, control panels and, and uh, you know, lighting and heating controls in a lot of our buildings, and all, and all of our new buildings are certified to the LEED Gold standard or above all the new buildings. So this is. Um, this is, this is something that really energizes, I think, our students. They, they like the idea that Yale is, is trying to lead by example. We've, we've, up, we've, we've, uh, we've also um, introduced sustainable food into the dining halls, and that has tremendous student uptake. I mean, we have a, there's a farm up on Edward Street, just a few blocks from campus, that, uh, that a lot of students are engaged in, and there's educational activities around sustainable, um, sustainable food um, that I think of have also gotten a lot of students keenly interested. You know, it's important, I think, while that students learn that we have finite resources on this planet and we are in a big mess in terms of abusing uh, the ability of the, of the natural environment to support our continued prosperity and development. And, uh, you know, we, I believe we need to take action and we're trying to show students that, that uh, learning about these things uh, when they're young and changing their habits are, are, would be really a good thing. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much for coming to talk to us today, President Levin. Uh, Max Professor Lenhoff just graduated class of 2012 mm -hmm. uh, as a chemistry major. And I say that specifically because my question's about innovation. Uh, and I'm currently working in the chemical industry. But mm -hmm. my question is, it, the United States has been seen recently Historically, we've been great on innovation, but recently the competition has gotten fierce in the international scene. And I was wondering if you could comment on how in the, um, you know, in the industrial sector, in the academic sector, what can we do to stay at the top in terms of innovation and to, I, I mean, just going forward and, yeah, and what would the role of, what would Yale's role be in, in that yeah. vision? Well, you know, you know, we were in an unusual situation from the end of World War II till the last decade of being, um, you know, uh, uh, really having our economy intact and strong, of having the, an educational system that encouraged in its best students uh, um, uh, kind of independent thinking and creativity and, and, and the capacity to innovate. Um, uh, our system was much less rigid, much more fluid, much more multidisciplinary, and we focused on a pedagogy at places like Yale, but also, you know, the whole top tier of the U.S. education system of educating people to think for themselves and not learn by rote. That, that gave us a tremendous advantage. We also had, you know, the, the, the most accessible capital markets in the world, so that the whole, a whole venture capital sector that made startups possible in a way that was very much more difficult in Europe and Asia. Um, this is starting to change because the rest of the world has recognized that these key elements of the formula, which is, which is education and, and, and capital markets uh, uh, that allow, that finance small businesses, those things are starting to spread to other places and we are, and, you know, there's a, the endowment of innate brain power is pretty well distributed around the world. We don't have a monopoly on that. We just had natural advantages, I think, from our, from our system. 
that's being, that's being imitated in other places and we're facing more competition. Uh, there's no other way to, to counter it except to continue to invest in education and, and, and training and infrastructure, you know, making sure we, that our universities have the best equipment and state-of-the-art equipment so our students can be trained on, 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 you know, at the highest level and then can take that, th that knowledge out into industry. Um, and, uh, uh, and to, you know, to sort of support, um, you know, the, the continue to make sure that small startup businesses but also small and growing businesses get access uh, to the financing they need. I, I'm not pessimistic about this dimension. I mean, even though the, you know, the, the, uh, even though there's been a lot of catch up in, in uh, Asia, if you look at what happened in Japan in the, around 1990, they hit a wall because they, 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 they turned out they could get their manufacturing quality way up and their production engineering, but they, they, they didn't have anything like the capacity to produce new products that the U.S. economy had. Um, China, China, unless they can truly reform their educational system, will hit that wall too. Um, so, so I think we still, we still have an edge. Uh, Dan Bendor, class of 67. Uh, question about the Singapore project, yeah. which is, uh, I, I'm interested in what your thoughts are as to its potential pluses and potential minuses, because whenever there's something done in the social science arena with people, there are both potential pluses and minuses, both for Yale and for the Pacific Rim, which has been characterized in one book's title as an area of three billion new uh, capitalists. So if you could speak to, to that for Yale and for the Pacific Rim. Yeah. And, right. and will, will students be able from other countries be able, will, will the Singapore campus allow a certain number of students from yeah, yeah. other countries in the region oh, yeah. to go? Yeah. So the idea is to set up a, to create, I mean, I, I, well, let me say first of all, I think this is an incredibly exciting opportunity that we, that for Yale to make a huge impact on higher education in Asia. So it's going to draw half of its students from outside Singapore, half from inside. and and. Uh, and we, we are recruiting throughout Asia and also in Europe and the United States for the first class that will come in 2013. Um, the, the, the pluses from an Asian perspective are showing that, you know, creating a school that has the dimensions of, a, of an American liberal arts education. So uh, not, instead of four years of specialized education, what we have, which is two years of general education and then some concentration in one subject. So you get multidisciplinary perspective. A critical pedagogy, a pedagogy of small classes that, that encourages students to think for themselves and to develop their own ideas in the way that we do here and in a way that is foreign to most Asian universities, which re rely much more on rote learning and think about the transmission of content rather than developing the capacity to think. So it's going to be American in those respects. It's also going to have residential colleges and try to replicate the kind of social environment and community building that we have here. Those are the sort of those are the ways in which we're taking something to Asia. But then we're going beyond that because we talked about interdis interdisciplinarity a few minutes ago. This college will pre creates a laboratory for educational innovation unlike no other. Why? Because there are no vested interests. When we did a curriculum reform here at Yale a decade ago, it was interesting and there were some good things that happened. But you know, a lot of this is turf warfare between departments trying to protect their interests and their access to students. We're starting from scratch. We have no departments in Singapore. Faculty are hired for the by the college. They're gonna be organized into broad divisions, humanities, social science, and natural science. The courses are gonna cross disciplinary boundaries. All of the, there'll be a common core that's interdisciplinary in sort of literature and, the, and, visu and visual arts, on the one hand, philosophy and political thought, the second one, social institutions and, and social science is the third, and natural science is the fourth, core courses people take through their first year, and, and um, the, the amount of innovation that's going on, oh, then the other feature is east and west. So, so the, the students will not read, um, only about Western European experience in their, in their uh, core courses. They'll, they'll, they will read side by side classics of 
Asian literature and, and Western literature. Confucius and Aristotle were contemporaries. You read them side by side. They ex seeing them side by side, you actually learn a lot about, um, you know, for example, to read the politics next to the, analy the, the analects, you see um, that there's a lot of commonality in the way these two th great thinkers think about citizenship and, and obligations to the polis. But you also see that there's tremendous differences in the role that family plays and filial piety and obligation in one culture and much less more secondary role in another um, where the focus is on the individual. And so I, I think we're going to, I think we're onto something really exciting. I think students will develop uh, uh, in an extraordinary way. Uh, and I think we'll, some of that innovation will spill back to, to Yale and New Haven. And potential, it does sound exciting, potential yeah. shoals that well, you can Well, the biggest imagine? potential shoal is, you know, you're in a, you're in a country where uh, the political norms are different from here. And, and the, you know, some of the Yale faculty are very concerned about that. And it's a legitimate worry. And we've tried to build the safeguards that will, that will make this work. I mean, we've assured there, there, there are certain rules in Singapore that we have been able to get waived for our campus, such as student organizations will not have to register with the government. Um, the the student, students can form uh, groups and have their membership that are completely in accord with our non-discrimination policies we practice here. So for example, the, we'll be able to have LGBT groups uh, at the campus, we'll be, we'll be able to have political, uh, a political union which today in Singaporean universities can only, the only Singaporeans can be members. We've gotten that relaxed. So we've worked a little bit to get, to create more space for political expression on our, on, on our campus. And I, you know, it'll be, you know, it's a risk. There's a risk there. But, uh, and we do have, you know, if it doesn't go well, we can get out. We've got, a, we've got an exit clause as part of our deal. So I think it's gonna be great, actually. It's gonna Thank be really you. Terrific. Please, and I'd also encourage others to come up to the mics as we go. Please go ahead. Hi, David Must, class of 82. Um, we're here uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of uh, Ezra Stiles College and um, uh, a physical manifestation of its time and it's uh, taken perhaps 50 years to really reach its apotheosis and thank you for <laughs> all of your investment in that. Um, but I, I wonder, since we're discussing the college life and uh, the future of the university, um, about the decision-making process that led to uh, the two new residential colleges, and um, to some extent, they're they're more referential to the James Gamble Rogers campus than they are to a sort of 21st century uh, architectural um, uh, aesthetic. So that was it. So. Uh, it was an interesting call uh, to try to decide what architectural style to employ um, in the new colleges. Um, Yale, Yale has an interesting campus texture. We have a core of facilities, a very large core in this kind of neo-Gothic idiom. And then we also very well reflect the architecture of the time. So you've got buildings, um, you know, like the Beinecke Library and the science, the, the, the Klein buildings on Science Hill and, the, and the, uh, uh, the Louis Kahn Art Museums that, that essentially are buildings that reflect the best of contemporary architecture at the time they were built. Well, I wouldn't say that about the Klein buildings on Science Hill, but I would, I would, I would, say, that about, I would say that about the Louis Kahn buildings, about the Beinecke, about uh, Ingalls Rink and so forth, and, uh, and these buildings. Um, but, um, but we had, you know, a number of projects in the pipeline back in 2005, six, seven, when we were starting to think about this. And, um, you know, we consulted the community, we polled students, we thought about these things. Um, and, uh, you know, in particular, we were more or less simultaneously making a decision about what style to use for the new colleges and also for the new building for the School of Management. And, you know, interesting, not surprisingly, Yale college students very much wanted the neo-Gothic style used in the new colleges. Um, and stunningly, SOM students, you know, you know supposedly a modern, forward-looking business school, they wanted the, the neo-Gothic style also overwhelmingly in their, in their new building. 
well, we, 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 the corporation, we debated this, officers in the corporation, and, um, and felt, you know, we, we, Yale needs to do both. And there was, of course, this, was, this happened before these buildings were renovated, and, and Stiles and Morse. And I think, you know, it's possible a decision would have been different afterward, because I think at the time there was a view that the neo-Gothic organization of these, of these, you know, sort of actually worked better. And, and so use the traditional style for the colleges and do something, you know, contemporary, make a, build a great contemporary building for SOM. That was, I mean, that's pretty much the way it went. Yeah. And I, I, I don't really regret it. Bob Stern has designed some really phenomenal buildings for the new colleges. Alas, the, the financial crisis has meant that while we've now fully developed the plans and we have construction drawings ready to go, we, have, we, are, um, we don't have the funds yet. So we're still awaiting that. Um, you know, anybody wants to give us a couple <laughs> hundred million dollars, we'll be <laughs> ready, to, ready to move. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Alicia Schmidt Camacho, the associate master here, and so I have the enviable job of being part of this extraordinary community, and it's been wonderful to be part of the 50th anniversary for a school I didn't go to, I didn't attend, but which I have the incredible privilege to work for. Um, but it's impossible not to notice uh, another renovation um, that has taken place under your leadership and I wanted to invite you to reflect on it further. Um, one of the things that the panelists from the early decades of Styles talked about was the diversification of the student body um, in the era of, of civil rights and the uh, decision to go co-ed. And to hear that experience and contrast it with the extraordinary initiatives taken here at Yale to bring first-generation college students here in large numbers to expand the right. possibilities for um, financial aid internationally as well as domestically. That has been the single best recruiting tool for mm -hmm. us hiring faculty here and for me um, staying and being able to do my scholarship and it's truly visible within this dining hall which is of course yes. beautiful but when you see what the residential college allows is it creates a common community that allows these groups and the uh, people from very different backgrounds to really make connections with each other and strong relationships in a way that I haven't seen in any of the other institutions that I belong to. And I wanted um, to thank you publicly but also ask you to reflect on the conversations that took place around the decision to maintain that financial aid commitment in the midst of an economic crisis in which so many pressing mandates were hitting this university, and yet you held firm in this and have been a model for, I know, our sister universities in maintaining this. And I wanted to ask you, because we are <laughs> in a moment in which many public leaders are saying perhaps four-year college is not a right and not a necessity for our young people. Um, and so you held firm in a moment in which people were willing to say this was not possible. So I wanted to thank you for that, but also ask you to tell us a little bit about those conversations. Yeah. Thank you. You know, it's interesting. It was, it was, it's so, it's become so much a part of the commitment of this institution that, that, that is the, the, the sort of idea that we want to make access to this place, you know, um, possible for the most talented and the, and the people with the most potential to contribute to society and that we want to compose a class that contains the, 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 the people of that character from all parts of the, of the social spectrum, socioeconomic spectrum, and across races and ethnicities. I mean, it, 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 as you say, I mean, you characterized it beautifully. I mean, it gives a vibrancy and a vitality to this place that's just extraordinary to have so many different types of students here who share one thing, which is they're brilliant, they're creative, they're energetic and they are all going to make great contributions to the world. So, you know, to, it, it, it really was last on the list of the, you know, when we thought about where do we take money out, I mean, uh, in order to meet the, 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 the you know, the, the demands of a diminished endowment, it, we, we just, I, 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 I mean, yes, I'll take, I'll take credit for that decision, but it was, I'm, I've got to tell you, it wasn't much of an argument because the corporation held to that view as strongly as I do. 
and the, the officers and the deans as well. So I, I think, and, and, we, and, the fa and you know the faculty also believes so strongly in this. So it, it, I think there was a community, I mean, yes, we could have tried to take a lot of money out of financial aid, we could have had a much softer landing in terms of other programs being spared. But you know, what are we here for, if not to give opportunity to the very best students in, you know, in our country and around the world? And so we stuck to that commitment, and I, I think it's, it's such a firm one that it's not really at risk. Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, start by saying I wanted to thank the administration and everybody who put this together. I think it's a great idea, and I hope they're able to do it for other uh, residential colleges. And I guess my question is, um, as you look at uh, the student body in an environment where people are being increasingly pressured to specialize early on, one of the tremendous benefits I thought of a Yale education for me was the opportunity to be a generalist, to explore different areas that I may never touch again, but contributed, I think, to an overall view of the world that was generally constructive. Right. And uh, I look at um, the kind of next generation coming up and seeing how uh, encouraged they are to specialize early on and that specialization sometimes precludes them from some of the more general uh, educational opportunities they might have. And I guess the question is, uh, how do you encourage in an environment where it's increasingly uh, encouraged, I think, for people to specialize early and kind of stay in that field um, to broaden their horizons, mm -hmm. to take classes that are outside of their majors or, or their disciplines, and to enjoy some of the great opportunities that they get educationally here uh, that are outside of their discipline. Yeah, so, so you, make, you make an interesting point about premature specialization, but you know, actually in our student body, I don't see that happening much academically. That is, the students, we still, you know, we require students to have done languages and have done literature and have done science. So, so they, I think by and large, we, you know, unlike universities in other, some other countries, we do not get prematurely tracked students, or not many of them, academically. But we do get them way pr to, I mean, I think this is a real problem in our society, and it, and it has to do with the competitiveness of institutions like Yale and our peers. There's a tremendous focus on specializing kids that parents are driving in order to get them to have something distinctive about them. So that instead of just good grades, they've gotta be a great musician, They've got to have developed, you know, they've got to develop some particular outside activity, a, a single sport. I mean, in my day, we played three sports. You know, there were three seasons. I mean, no more. Kids play one sport. Uh, you know, kids, kids over-specialize in something in order to get, you know, I, I, mean, I played three sports and debated on the debate team. You know, I mean, th it was much more common. And today, today kids, they, they, they focus an extra, their extracurricular on something to try to show that they excel. I, it, it's, it's a, it, 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 that's hard, and I don't know, I'm actually not quite sure how we can get the message out that we actually are interested in students that have more than one dimension, and that, 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 have, that have multiple interests. And we certainly encourage them to take that up here. Now it is true, what happens is, even here as students, Students usually t pick out one or two things they really pursue with great intensity rather than sampling a lot, but they do switch. And the things they do, and the things they do here that, that turn out to be their passion aren't necessarily the things they did in high school. So w they do explore, but then there, there is this sort of tendency to try to be really good at something. And uh, you know, I, 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 it's probably overdone. Thank you. Well. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation with President Levin. I, I certainly have. Um, I, I'm personally taking away um, three big thoughts uh, from this conversation. Uh, first of all, that Yale, the university, the college, and our residential colleges are in a position of tremendous strength today, probably historic strength. Um, second, that the biggest threat to Yale as an institution is that the other institutions that our economy and our society depend on fail to, if those institutions were to fail to solve the problems that, that, that face them and face sure. us. Um, and third, 
that Yale is contributing probably more than it ever has to solving these problems in New Haven uh, for our country and for the world. So President Levin, thank you very much for your insights today and for uh, really the amazing accomplishments of your historic and transformative tenure here at Yale. Thank you. Thank you, Byron.